Hi everyone, welcome back. Today, part two of our series on the French Revolution by Oversimplified. In the last episode, we left after the Bastille event and the start of the revolution. And then today, I think that we will see that things are going to get very, very serious. So without further ado, let's go. King Louis and his family were now in the Tuileries Palace in Paris, where for the next couple of years, he watched as the revolutionary government began to strip away his power. And fearing for his safety, he had to stay on their good side. Hey, look who it is. It's my favorite revolutionaries. Yep, I'm your number one fan. What can I do for you? Hey, King Louis. So we've made a few decisions. First, all of your friends in the nobility are going to have to pay taxes the same as everyone else. Great idea. I love it. And as a side note, the tax money can no longer pay for all your lavish parties. Great. I hate those parties. They're so awkward. And also, we're taking away your Porsche. Ah, oh, come on! I mean... Yay. The king continually found demand after demand being made of him to prove his support for the revolution. On one occasion, a mob would invade the palace and demand he wear the revolutionary bonnet. This is the face of a man who is definitely pretending he wants to wear that bonnet. Now around here... Yeah, of course, because Louis wants to keep his throne. That's his job as a monarch. If in his mind God gave him his crown, he does not have the power to take it away. And all his life, all his childhood, he's been conditioned with this idea that his power is divine. So he has to make everything to keep his crown. But on the other end, the people no longer see the king as God's representative, but as their own representative. In a constitutional monarchy, the God serves the people. Louis is no longer the king of France, is the king of the French people. This is what the red, white, blue flag symbolizes, by the way. The association with the people, red and blue. And the king, the white color. Seeing the situation rapidly turning against him, the king decided it might be a good idea to leave France and mount a campaign to retake his country from abroad. Luckily for him, he was married to an Austrian. So on the night of June 20th, 1791, the king and his family disguised themselves as servants and attempted to flee to the Austrian Netherlands. The royal carriage made a stop in the town of Varennes, and the postmaster there was like, Hey guys, what's up? Where are you off to? We are but a collection of inconspicuous servants heading for the border for no particular reason at all. Say, you, the fat one, you look kind of familiar. Aren't you the king? Nope. Let me see your passport. It says here you're King Louis the Sixteenth. Nope, not me. Take him away, boys. According to legend, Louis was recognized by a man, a postmaster, who was disturbed by his resemblance to the royal effigy on a shield because at the time most of the population didn't know what the king looked like and had never seen him. This whole escape to Varennes was very poorly organized by the way with many many mistakes and delays that led to the failure of the attempt and the overall consequence was of course that the people stressed in their king was totally ruined and this lent credence to the thesis that the king was playing both sides which he was doing just as any good politician does. The king was promptly returned to Paris, but now the jig was up. His lack of support for the revolution was clear to all, and many considered him a straight-up traitor who tried to abandon his people. As a result, the new constitution of 1791 completely reduced his powers to that of a simple figurehead, a constitutional monarch. However, radicals, such as those in the Jacobin Club, were outraged that the king wasn't to be removed entirely. So a month later, these radicals staged a protest on the Champ du Mars, calling for the king's removal. The government of Paris feared an insurrection was mounting, and they sent the military to disperse the crowd. The confrontation escalated and resulted in the Revolutionary National Guard firing on a crowd of revolutionaries. It was a massacre. The incident exposed a deep division within the Brotherhood of the Revolution. On one side, the moderates who wanted to keep the king as a figurehead. On the other, radicals who wanted to see the king deposed and heads roll. In the wake of the massacre, these radicals received a wave of support. 
And speaking of rolling heads, one form of equality the revolution introduced was equality in execution. This meant no more torturous drawing and quartering, no more inhumane hanging. They wanted all criminals, regardless of economic status, to receive the same penalty, a quick and painless one. Luckily, a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Guillotine had an idea. A heavy blade that falls like thunder. The head flies off, blood spurts, and the man is no more. The guillotine is the symbol, I guess, of the barbaric side of the revolution with these mass executions and so on. But at the time, it was almost a form of social progress. Because before that, the richer you were, the more you could afford a painless death to be beheaded by a skilled executioner who would kill you in one single blow was almost a luxury. Otherwise, you'd be hanged or burned or something else very, very painful. And then you had torture sessions, for example, for people who tried to assassinate kings, where you were slowly tortured before being put to death, but very, very slowly. The guillotine, otherwise known as the National Razor. The guillotine made its debut in 1791 as the new form of execution. The writings of Marat and others continued to call for the execution of anyone suspected of working against the revolution. For him, this included some members of the clergy and nobility who had previously benefited from the cruel system of inequality that existed before the revolution. In many parts of the countryside, local lords had found themselves become a target. Sire. The peasants, they're revolting. Oh, come on, that's a bit harsh. Sure, they smell a bit, but I wouldn't say they're revolting. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Increasingly, these French aristocrats began fleeing France to find solitude in other parts of Europe. And once again, fear began to take hold. The pr And fear is one of the greatest motivators in human history. It's going to be a very, very strong lever before the Great Terror. People were afraid of enemies on the outside and enemies on the inside. There are a lot of conspirational rumors, fake news, plots, and people were seeing traitors everywhere. Privileged classes of these foreign nations didn't like what they were seeing because they feared revolutionary ideas may spread to their own lands. The National Assembly, actually now the Legislative Assembly, feared that these nations may decide to attack. Then why don't we attack them first? No, you idiots, we are definitely not ready for war yet. Did somebody say something? France declared war in Austria in April 1792 and immediately got pummeled. It also didn't help that Austria's ally, Prussia, joined in the fighting. The Prussian Duke of Brunswick posted a letter warning the revolutionaries that if anything happened to the king, he would burn Paris to the ground. The Duke's letter proved to be a massive success in inspiring the people of Paris to do the exact opposite of what he intended. They were Honestly, it's a bit of a dick move because it's already going to radicalize the people who aren't necessarily fan on Prussia or Austria or of any hostile monarchy. What's more, it will reinforce the idea that the king is a traitor and that is on the side of external enemies. And what's more, for the new power, having external enemies is the best way to unite your people against a common threat. They were enraged by the threat, and on the 10th of August 1792, the tension in the city exploded, and a mob stormed the king's palace. Fighting broke out between the revolutionaries and the king's Swiss guard, with casualties in the hundreds. King Louis fled and took refuge in the chamber of the Legislative Assembly, where Robespierre and his radical Jacobins were gaining ever more power. Given the developing situation, the chamber decided to hold a vote, and in what some considered to be a second revolution, it was decided to suspend the monarchy entirely. King Louis VI until his deposition, Louis XVI had still one major power, the right of veto over the assembly, and he used it a lot to block many proposals to deal with the crisis situation to the point that the people started to nickname him Monsieur Veto. So he was a big problem, actually. 16th was now just plain old Louis, and he was sent to a prison cell where an eye could be kept on it. A month later, the newly established National Convention officially declared the French Republic, and society underwent a massive change. Enlightened ideas of democracy and equality were being implemented, but very quickly, these ideas seemed to become secondary to fear, paranoia, and a thirst for blood. The new Fear and paranoia, yeah, probably, yeah, I agree. Um, thirst for blood is a bit extreme. 
it seems a bit uh, cliche to me because people don't suddenly become, you know, psychopaths who want to kill everything that moves. Yeah, they are afraid. They, they need to be secured, but they don't become cruel like that. New Republic began working to violently remove any semblance of the old royalist regime. The church became a prime target. Priests who refused to take an oath to the revolution were deported or arrested. A new state-sponsored atheistic religion named the Cult of Reason was created as a replacement for the Catholic Church, Notre Dame. As a replacement for the Catholic Church, that's a big one because were the Enlightenment philosopher I taste the one who you know, who were the big thinkers behind the revolution. Yeah, they were probably. The church was violently opposed to the revolution, but not just to defend the Catholic faith against the barbaric revolutionaries, as it's often portrayed. It's because if the revolution declared that all men were born free and equal, both in rights and in duties, clerics were citizens like everyone else, and they had to pay taxes. And for once, church property is subject to taxation. And incidentally, this was the first betrayal of Talleyrand, who was before the revolution, a bishop who abandoned the church, sided with the revolutionaries, and proposed that the church property would be taxed. At this point, France is and remains a very Catholic country. The rural population was not going to stop being religious, all of a sudden because of the new ideas of the revolution. No, that would never going to happen. But you have to be careful what you tell them. And priests or opinion leaders, they can address and speak to a whole town during mass. And people used to trust them so they are opinion leaders. So it's absolutely necessary and essential to control these peoples and avoid cause for counter-revolution. And that was the whole point of having the priests swear an allegiance to the revolution, is to control them. Along with many other churches had their religious treasures destroyed and were converted to temples of reason. Even the Christian calendar didn't survive as a brand new revolutionary calendar was soon introduced. Hey honey, I'm home. Yeah, whatever jerk. Whoa, what's wrong with you? You forgot. Forgot what? Everything. This entire year. My birthday was on the 3rd of Germinal. Our anniversary was the 12th of Thermidor, and you promised that in Freimere, we'd go on a romantic weekend trip to Venice. No, I said we'd do that in December. December hasn't been a thing for years. The government of Paris, now under the control of the radical Saint-Culotte, began rounding up suspected enemies of the revolution and sending them to prison in the thousands. Naturally, a large number of those arrested were members of the clergy and aristocracy. As France's foreign enemies continued to close in, panic spread. Georges Danton made impassioned calls for men to defend the Republic and tens of thousands of troops left Paris for the front lines. However, in their absence, Paris was left to its own devices. As enemy troops arrived in Verdun, the people of Paris feared that their crowded prisons were becoming a breeding ground for counter-revolutionary conspiracy. What would happen if the Prussians reached Paris and freed the aristocrats? Marat believed he knew what would happen. The aristocrats would enact their vengeance on the people. Fearing those they had already imprisoned, mobs descended on Paris's prisons. They broke in, and during the brutal September massacres, aristocrats, priests, and others were tried and executed on the spot. Even women and children weren't spared. With over 1,600 victims, word of the massacre spread across Europe. One British newspaper wondered, are these the rights of man? Is this the liberty of human nature? But there was still one man in particular. So it's a perfect example of what fear can do. So word began to spread that the arrested royalists were plotting to slit the throats of the patriots in the prisons where they were being held. When Verdun is being taken and then the news reaches Paris, panic sets in. Then Danton makes this very ambiguous speech. And a few hours later, the crowd goes wild. A prison is stormed and almost of the hundred priests were there or massacred on the spot. Yeah, horrible.
particular that Robespierre and his radicals really wanted to see executed. Austria and Prussia pledged that after they defeated France, they'd return King Louis to the throne. Well, checkmate Austria and Prussia, because you can't return a man to the throne if he's already dead. Citizen Louis Capet was put on trial for treason. Obviously, he was found guilty, but his punishment was less certain. Many moderates wanted to simply deport him, but Robespierre insisted the revolution could only live if the king was dead. A vote was held, and by just one vote, Louis was sentenced to the guillotine. If you don't mind, I'd like to say a few words first. Gentlemen, I am innocent of everything of which I am acute. Wait, you're too loud. They can't hear me. Hang on, I haven't finished yet. Wait, dude. Uncool. In her prison cell, Marie Antoinette heard the guns fire, signaling her husband's death. Before long, she would meet the same fate. Okay, so perhaps is the moment when you wonder what I think about it as a Frenchman. So Louis has been seen as the, the guilty for this whole situation by many. He's also been seen as a martyr by others. Personally, it's not that I don't care, but I mean, it's a political gesture which at this stage can seem kind of logical and it's part of our history. So it's part of what makes us who we are as a nation. So I accept it. I have more empathy, for example, for Marie Antoinette and the children, for example. And if you want to judge the execution of Louis XVI, you have to put things in context. The revolution is an extremely violent era and it claimed almost as many lives as the First World War in France. Back on the war front, France defied all expectations and actually managed to push the enemy back. But then more countries joined the coalition against France and it all went to pot again. What do we do? Conscript the masses! The National Convention introduced a conscription law, with each regional department having to meet a certain quota of men for the army. However, not everyone was happy with this new law. You see, while Paris was definitely a hotbed for radical revolutionary fervor, some of the regions outside of Paris weren't quite so keen on the revolution. Some were largely still conservative, still supported the church, and just didn't suffer from that much inequality before the revolution. So as the revolution turned increasingly violent and anti-Christian, many were outraged. Now, they were being conscripted to fight for the new republic they hated. That was the last straw. Counter- Yes. But here again, I'm going to play the revolution's lawyer. So conscription also means that citizens can now take up arms to defend the nation in danger. And that too is a kind of social progress. War is no longer the preserve of nobles and aristocrats. It's everyone's duty. Many conscripts realize that they have a country a nation to defend. It's a bit as in the US Civil War where soldiers are going to travel to other states and they are going to realize that they fight not only for their own state but their nation as a whole. And that will also happen in France. This is where the Marseillaise, our national anthem, is composed and tells the whole story. The conscripts from Marseille are singing it as they march up to the Rhine to fight against the Austrians and the Prussians. And if you listen to the lyrics carefully, what it says, it's, uh, let's go children of the motherland. We are all childs of the same nation. The day of glory has come. You can cover yourself in glory, even if you are a lowborn. And let's have an impure blood waters the furrows. We don't know who the impure blood is, actually. A lot of people think that it's the enemy's blood, but no, it's not the enemy's. It's that one of the revolutionaries, the nobles and the poor, whose blood is, um, is impure because they come from the low classes. The revolutionary uprisings erupted in a number of regions across France. Some would last for years, such as in the Northwest, where a large-scale uprising was led by the Owls. Why were they called the Owls? Because their leader was named Jean Owl. Why was he called Jean Owl? Possibly because he could do a really good impression of an owl. Really? That's what we're going with? 
owls, just because this guy can do an impression of one? Hit him with it, Jean. Hoot hoot. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. The Shuanery uprising lasted all the way until 1800. In the summer of 1793, the southern city of Toulon invited the British Navy over for some tea and crumpets. And then they asked if they'd possibly like to stay and occupy the city. Being an important naval base, this was a heavy blow to the Republic, who sent a relatively unknown young captain by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte to help stage the siege of the city. Toulon was recaptured by France in the winter, and for his service, Napoleon was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. The most infamous counter-revolution, however, occurred in the Vendée region. Throughout 1793, revolutionary forces clashed with the region's Catholic and Royal Army. The Republic defeated the counter-revolution through cruel pacification. In particular, General Jean-Baptiste Carrier committed brutal atrocities. In one instance, he had thousands of civilians, priests, women and children tied to ships, which were then sunk. Carrier would later be found guilty of war crimes and executed. No, that's probably the most horrible episode of the whole revolution. In experience and disciplined troops are sent in with very, very vague and ambiguous directives to quell the insurrection. The whole thing degenerates in a horror movie. I will give you one example of atrocities. It's the what was called the Republican Weddings, where you had two priests tied together and were thrown into the water to drown. Horrible. Back in Paris, the government was still dominated by moderates. With the war going badly, revolts in the provinces, and the economy getting worse, it seemed the government just wasn't doing a very good job. Radicals' fear for the safety of the revolution intensified, and Marat even began calling for the moderates in the government to be executed. In return, the moderates called for the arrest of Marat. This led to a chain of events with the two sides in heated conflict. Robespierre declared the Jacobins to be an insurrection and called on the people to arm themselves. It all ended on the 31st of May 1793, with the National Convention surrounded by radical Saint-Culotte and 29 moderate Girondin politicians arrested. From this moment on, the moderates ceased to be a political force. Robespierre and his radicals would be in almost total control of the government. And this brings us to the story of a woman named Charlotte Corday. Charlotte lived in the northwest city of Caen, and like many in the area, was horrified at the rapid radicalization and increasing violence of the revolution. And the man she blamed more than anyone was Jean-Paul Marat. She wanted to bring peace back to France, and so she did something drastic. She traveled to Paris and told Marat she had a list of enemies for him to publish in his paper. Marat eagerly invited her in for a meeting. So where's that list of enemies you promised me? Here it is. Wait a minute. This isn't a list of enemies. It just says, yippee ki -yay, mother f And just like that, Marat was no more. So Charlotte Corday is a great example of the complexity and the contradictions of the revolution. She's an aristocrat, but she's very much in favor of the revolution and of the new constitution. She saw the excesses of violence and Marat's appeal in his newspaper, L'Ami du Peuple. She wants to save the revolution and one deputy declares, bring down Marat's head and the father on is saved. Et voilà. Charlotte was quickly arrested and sent to the guillotine. Her dream of restoring peace, however, died with her. Marat became a martyr. In Temples of Reason, symbols of the dead Marat became the new crucifix. In death, he became an even more powerful inspiration for the extreme levels of violence that were about to rip throughout the new republic. Now we have a martyr. And that's right, here comes the reign of terror. If you thought this revolution already sounds pretty violent, well you ain't seen nothing yet, son. The radicals were now in control, and they believed not only was France surrounded by foreign enemies, but that within the masses, there were also plenty of internal ones too. Individuals not loyal to the revolution, conspiring to bring about its downfall. Robespierre and the rest of the radical faction were having none of it. A new committee of public safety was established with 12 members. Its purpose was to protect the new French Republic from its enemies, and it basically became a 12-man dictatorship with Robespierre as its leading voice. The Revolutionary Tribunal was also reinstated. A special court created to streamline the process of trying suspected enemies and handing out their death sentences. With these two new institutions, Robespierre wanted to scare France's enemies straight. In September 1793, it was announced that terror would be the order of the day. 
In other words, fear had become official government policy. And from then onwards, we enter into the period known as the Reign of Terror. Spies and secret police were everywhere and watched the people closely. France's public had to be extremely careful what they said and how they behaved. Obviously, criticizing this new system or the government would quickly have you sent off to the guillotine. But that's not all. Even the most minor offense could have you tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. Hello, Citizen Martin. Hello, Monsieur Dubois. Monsieur? Did I just hear you say Monsieur? That's the old style of address, my friend. To the guillotine! You know what? I didn't like him, but I do feel kind of bad for the king and his family. Oof, expressing sympathy for the royal family, are we? To the guillotine! 12 sous for a loaf of bread? That's way overpriced! To the guillotine! Man, this bread line is taking forever! To the guillotine! And you? You look like you're thinking anti-revolutionary thoughts. To the guillotine. Max, we're sending way too many people to the guillotine. To the guillotine! Chop, 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 chop. It was insane. All across France, about 40,000 people were killed for suspected crimes against liberty. Let's say your neighbor won And you had an additional half a million who were sent to prison during the period. Once stop mowing the lawn at 7 in the morning. Well, then all you gotta do is tell the government they've been talking smack about the revolution. And there's a good chance they'll end up in front of the revolutionary tribunal. Maybe they'll even be executed, taking a metaphorical load off your shoulders and a literal one off theirs. The most prominent victim of the reign of terror was a certain Marie Antoinette, who was finally tried and found guilty of treason in 1793. She expected she'd be brought to the guillotine in a royal carriage, fit for a queen. All the Republic could provide for her, however, was a wooden tumbrel. At 37 years old, the most hated woman in French history met her end on the 16th of October, 1793. Honestly, her trial is a scandal. She's accused of every moral crime, depravity, incest, treasons, and so on. It is so far-fetched that, honestly, it's laughable. And she remains extremely dignified right up to the end, taking the mother to task and moving them. And on top of that, she was suffering, I guess, breast cancer. So she remained a very brave woman till the end. Robespierre had saved the revolution through terror. Internal dissent was being suppressed. The food situation was no longer quite as bad. Even the French military had got its act together again and pummeled the Allies at the Battle of Fleurus. For Danton and his followers, the time was ripe to try to normalize the French Republic. Hey Robespierre, so we were thinking that since things are finally going better, maybe we should rein in the terror. And while we're on it, we could possibly start taking it easier on the church and also try to end this costly war. Hmm. Oh, crap. As time went on, Robespierre seemed to go, for lack of a better term, a bit mental. He was hell-bent on creating what he called a republic of virtue. And for him, this meant amping up the bloodshed even more. Throughout the spring and summer of 1794, executions reached an unprecedented level during a period known as the Great Terror. Even those closest to him found their way to the guillotine if they dared oppose his ideas and actions. And he began alienating himself from the rest of the convention. He created a new deistic religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being, along with the new annual Festival of the Supreme Being. Man, I think Robespierre is really starting to lose it. He thinks he's a god or something. Nonsense. Sure, he's gone a little extreme, but he doesn't think he's a god. My children, bathe your immortal souls in the virtue of my republic. Okay, yeah, he's completely lost it. Robespierre's ultimate mistake, however, came on July 26th when he made a speech to the National Convention in which he said this, I have in my hand a brand new list of enemies to be sent to the guillotine, and many of you are on this list, but I'm not going to tell you who yet. What do you think of that? I think we should send Robespierre to the guillotine first. All in favor? Don't know. Two days later, Robespierre became the final victim of the monstrous terror and paranoia he had created. So this fits very well in the narrative, making Robespierre the film's great villain. He's been a bit of a scapegoat in the old stuff and a lot of the stereotypes of the great moustache dictators of the 20th are pinned on him. And honestly, it's much more complicated than that. First of all, he was not alone and his actions are much more complicated. He was certainly a very Machiavellian character, 
But if we want to complete the picture, we'll also say that he tried to limit the violence of terror, which is also a popular movement. It strengthened democracy, tried to defend peace and social justice. He was a defender of the poor and played a key role in the abolition of slavery in France. Many historical accounts of the revolution end here, with the death of Robespierre and his terror. But the revolution officially continued for another five years, until 1799. So what happened between now and then? Well, after the fall of Robespierre, a more moderate political group called the Thermidorians took control of the convention. They wanted to restore stability to the government. Now, Robespierre's allies and other radicals who had fueled the terror themselves became the target of political suppression. Bourgeois street fighters took on the radical Saint-Culoc in the streets during a period named the White Terror. In 1795, the Thermidorians drafted a new constitution and created a government called the Directory with the purpose of preventing power from being able to fall into the hands of a single individual again. As this new government was being established, royalists, who wanted to bring the monarchy back to France, saw this moment as an opportunity to strike. They staged an insurrection in Paris and battled with the National Guard in the streets. Luckily, one Napoleon Bonaparte happened to be in Paris at the time, and he took control of the situation, firing on the crowd and putting down the insurrection. From this moment on, the people of Paris would never again be able to stage a popular uprising and lost their control over the revolution. Never again at least until the next revolution. For his actions, Napoleon became a general and was sent to take control of the French armies in Italy. The new directory remained a fairly ineffective government for the remainder of the revolution. It was plagued with corruption and struggled to keep the economy afloat and as a result, wasn't very popular. For the people of France, with the strict social customs of both royalist France and the tarragon, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Men no longer removed their hats when talking to women, different classes began intermingling, and a publication began circulating that looked a lot like a modern dating app. It was social anarchy. Outside of France, the war continued. In 1795, France took the Netherlands, where they set up a puppet state. Then they negotiated both Prussia and Spain out of the war. The British attempted to land French royalists in the west to reinforce rebellion, but that plan failed. In 1796, the French planned a three-pronged attack with the aim of marching on Vienna and knocking Austria out of the war. The two northern armies were defeated and forced to retreat. However, Napoleon in the south, with groundbreaking military strategy, won battle after battle after battle. He pushed the Austrians out of Italy and began closing in on Vienna. The Austrians freaked out and Napoleon oversaw the signing of a peace treaty. He had and he did all of this with a very, very limited support from the Directoire. And now we can talk a bit about the Directoire. The Directoire is corrupt and relies heavily on war to keep the economy going, enriching itself in the process and boosting its prestige. This makes them very vulnerable to, let's say, a general who would become very, very popular and secure the army's trust. It almost single-handedly knocked Austria out of the war. And by the way, he was only 28. So maybe it's about time you moved out of your mom's basement. Napoleon became a famed hero among the French people, but his aspirations were still higher. He briefly went off to Egypt and discovered a bunch of gnarly Egyptian stuff, but then the British destroyed his fleet and trapped his forces. Say, Napoleon, sir, you're not going to leave us here stuck in Egypt and return to France, are you? Nonsense, my boy. I would never dream of abandoning my loyal soldiers. Wow, what's that over there? On his return to Paris, Napoleon found himself to be extremely popular and the government extremely unpopular, and he started getting some power-hungry ideas. Conveniently, a politician named Emmanuel Joseph Sieyes approached Napoleon and said, Hey man, since you're so popular, do you want to help me stage a coup? Great idea. Let's stage a coup and then I'll... Um... Yeah, Sieyes needed a military man to pull off his coup, so he looked for a general and after several options, he settled on Napoleon, who intervened very, very late in the plot. He was only really involved in, in the last moments. Coup you? What? Napoleon, with the help of his politician brother, entered the government chamber, possibly got punched in the face, and finally his troops intimidated the council to dissolve the government and create a new constitution that basically made Napoleon a dictator. So that a dictator, yes, but no, at least not right away, and not a dictator in the 20th century sense. Little by little, he will take on greater importance 
than the other consuls. You had three consuls, amongst them Napoleon, but at the end of the day, he will remain the only one. He will secure his power through his charisma, prestige, and intelligence. There you have it. The French Revolution, born with the great promise of liberty and equality. The common people dared challenge an oppressive system that had existed for centuries. But before they knew it, they found liberty sidelined by terror, equality that possibly didn't quite hit the mark, and an absolute monarchy replaced by an absolute dictator. Napoleon began stabilizing French society. He restored the Catholic Church and got rid of that crazy calendar, among other things. But he remained ever ambitious. He was France's first consul, but he slept soundly at night dreaming of being something even bigger. Napoleon's expansionist aspirations, combined with the ongoing conflict in Europe, would eventually lead the continent into a huge conflict known today as... Okay, I guess this is it. I have to say that I disagree with the last part where they portrayed Napoleon as this absolute dictator. Uh, see how, just how quickly people got rid of him once he stopped to be a great conqueror. On the contrary, I'd say that he secured some of the progress of the revolution with the meritocratic system, which is now a base of our constitution, with the civil code with freedom of worship and so on. Of course, he has a very big dark side with the reinstitution of slavery, with the wars, but on, that's a topic that would deserve hours of conversation. Anyway, um, the revolution is still a very dynamic debate and we are still not agree amongst ourselves, but that's what makes history so interesting. Anyway, thank you for watching and talk to you very soon. Bye, guys.